Okay, so Santa Ana's army, 6,000 men, doesn't move that quickly. Information or news travels faster than an army. So in Texas, in San Antonio, where the convention was held and they voted to, for self-government, they hear that this big Mexican army is coming, and they just try to decide what are we going to do about this. And so ultimately a vote is held, and most of the Texans there vote, pardon me, in favor of retreating to the east, meeting up with a lot of other Texans there under the leadership of a guy named Sam Houston, Houston, Texas, right? That's where, that's where his name is going to go. Um, and then ultimately fighting the Mexican army with a much bigger army. But there's uh, like 182 guys, okay, in San Antonio that are, I guess, the dumbest 182 Texans in the history of Texas, even up to now, okay? And they say, we ain't going to run away from any damn Mexicans. But uh, we, I, we, any one of us can lick 10 Mexicans with our best hand tied behind our back and hopping on one leg. We ain't going nowhere. And they say, well, what are you going to do? And they say, we're going to get in the Alamo. We're going to fight from there. And so they make this plan about how these guys are going to hold off the Mexican army from inside the Alamo. Okay, now here's the Alamo. There's a modern photograph. It's, you know, a major part of Texas, a big historic park thing. Here's a, an illustration of the Alamo from back in the day. You know, the, <clears throat> the story of the independence of Texas at the heart of that is the Battle of the Alamo. Okay, it's a very big deal to the people of Texas. Here's a monument, okay, in memory of the heroes who sacrificed their lives at the Alamo in the defense of Texas. They chose never to surrender nor retreat. These brave hearts with flags still proudly waving perish in the flames of immortality that their high sacrifice might lead to the founding of this Texas, okay? And up here, this, this inscription is right here. Uh, but then up here, you see William Barrett Travis, who was the leader of the Defenders of the Alamo, Davy Crockett, talk about these guys in a minute. There was a third guy named, I started to say David Bowie, Jim Bowie. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Travis, Crockett, and Bowie. These guys are the, are the legendary three champions, okay, of the whole Alamo story, right? William Barrett Travis, who you see here in the center, has been portrayed in two movies, each of them called The Alamo, one made in 1960, one made in 2004, Lawrence Harvey on my left, Patrick Wilson on my right, okay? They played William Barrett Travis, right? Now, who is William Barrett Travis? Who is this guy <clears throat> whose name you see all across Texas? Guys, you can go to every town in Texas, the dinkiest little fly speck, the Houstons, Dallas's, and Austin's, and you're going to see liquor stores, parks, boulevards, government buildings, libraries, gun stores, okay? I mean, more places and things named Travis, Bowie, Crockett than you can imagine. And the, the whole state is lousy with their three names. These guys are big stuff, right? They must be some kind of hero. So who is this William Bear Travis? Travis was a guy who tried to make a life for himself farming up in Missouri. He had a wife, kids, and he just got sick of it. And he just split one day, deserted his wife and his kids, and headed for Texas to look for gold and glory, something better than being a dirt farmer with a nagging wife and a squalling pack of youngins. And I mean, is that a hero? Is that a guy that you name a school after? I mean, it sounds like a deadbeat dad to me, right? Like, a, like an unfit husband, I mean, really? Okay. Then there's <clears throat> Jim Bowie, who was famous for that big knife that he carried, the Bowie knife. All right? You know, like Travis, he was brave. He was a tough guy, there's no question. Portrayed by Richard Widmark, 1960, Jason Patrick in 2004. You know, but Bowie was also a backstabber, meaning really a backstabber, not like what you write on Facebook, you backstabber, you stole my girlfriend, or whatever. No, this was a guy 
who actually jumped out from the darkness when people walked by that he didn't like, you know, and stuck him in the back, you know, stabbed him, killed him in the back, <laughs> rather than fight them up front. I mean, he was tough. He would he would fight face to face, but sometimes he liked to get things done on the down low. Backstabbing. Okay, another guy that you should name schools and community centers and parks after, right? Okay, now last but not least, there was Davy Crockett, portrayed by John Wayne. You heard me. No less than John Wayne in 1960, Billy Bob Thornton in 2004. Now, Davy Crockett's a little bit different than the other guys, okay? Barrett and Travis. Davy Crockett was an Indian fighter and a big hero in the War of 1812, fought with Andrew Jackson against the Creek Indians, ultimately was elevated to the United States Congress. He was elected to the House of Representatives by the people of his state, Tennessee. And at the time that Santa Ana's army was heading north towards Texas, the United States Congress heard about this by way of the telegraph, right? Like fast transmission of information. And so a debate came up in Congress. Should the United States government send the Navy with a lot of soldiers on a bunch of ships down to Texas to save these American settlers from the Mexican army? Well, they voted on it. And they voted no. They said they moved into Texas. They knew what they were getting into. They're apparently not obeying the laws. Why should we start a war with Texas or get or with Mexico or get involved in a war with Mexico on behalf of these these guys? I mean, forget it. We're not getting involved in this. No, it wasn't unanimous, but the majority vote said no. We're not getting involved. Well, Davy Crockett blew his staff. He got the floor. He walked up in front of the House of Representatives. And he made a passionate speech in favor of intervention, of sending military assistance, right? And then he called for one more vote after, like, really pouring his heart out in favor of this. And they voted again. It was basically the same vote. I don't know, maybe one or two guys changed their vote. But it was basically the same vote. We're not doing it. And so Crockett stood up there and he pointed at all these guys that had voted against helping the settlers in Texas. Like eight or ten guys just pointed at them, and then he said, well, all of you can go straight to hell, because I'm going to Texas. And he walked out of Congress. He went down to the telegraph office, and he sent a message back to his posse in Tennessee. He said, get on the Ohio River and head down to the Mississippi, and all you boys meet me in New Orleans in two weeks, because we're going to Texas to fight Mexicans. And he got on a ship. He sailed down around Florida, met these guys in New Orleans. They took ship for Texas. And all these Tennessee sharpshooters, with Davy Crockett at the head of them, they arrived at the Alamo the day before the battle began. I mean, like right in the nick of time. Okay? Now, Davy Crockett was a big deal. If you go to Disneyland today, Disneyland's divided up into Tomorrowland and Fantasyland, right? All these different areas. Frontierland. The whole concept of Frontierland was based on the American West, right? We got Tom Sawyer's Island and Splash Mountain and the, the shooting arcade and all this stuff. And the reason it sort of came about in the way it did was because in the 1950s, when they were putting Disneyland together, planning it, etc., <clears throat> the biggest show on television was Walt Disney's Davy Crockett. King of the Wild Frontier. First it was a TV series, and then it was a movie, as you can see right here, starring this cat named Fess Parker as Davy Crockett. This was the biggest show in the country for kids, not for grown-ups. For grown-ups is I Love Lucy. But for kids, it was Davy Crockett. And every kid in the country had a Davy Crockett coonskin cap imitation, not really made out of a raccoon. Okay, But yeah, Crockett wore a coonskin cap with the tail hanging down, right? You can see it right here. Kid's got his tail hanging down behind him. If you go to Frontierland today, guys, in Disneyland, and go into the shops there, they've got, you know, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Artificial, fake coonskin caps. If you're walking through Frontierland, you listen to the music from the speakers that are hidden up in the trees. 
like a burling don't 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 it's just banjo music, right? It's playing the theme song from the Davy Crockett show. Okay. In Peanuts, in the comic strip, you can see this is like a testimonial. These are strips from the early 1950s when the show was on TV. This is like a testimonial to how popular the show was because, of course, Charlie Brown has got his coonskin cap. Snoopy's got a coonskin cap. I mean, you can read through these cartoons if you like, pause, read them, or not. My point here simply is that Davy Crockett, 120 years after the Alamo, was still a big, big deal in the minds of Americans, right? He was just, you know, genuine American hero, okay? Now, here's a lithograph showing the siege of the Alamo, okay? It was like a two-week battle, more or less, but then finally it came down to the Mexicans storming the walls and going up ladders and breaking in the gate and all that and, you know, massacring everybody, right? Now, here's a bunch of various illustrations. Here you can see Crockett with his cap. These guys fighting over the wall, shooting over the walls at the Mexican troops. You know, I don't know the, the, the artist for any of these. Here's Crockett again with his gun over his head, like out of bullets and using it as a club. Okay, Dawn at the Alamo by Henry McArdle. This guy was a famous history painter, a horrible artist if you ask me, but it's a very famous painting. There's Dawn at the Alamo, 1905. There's another illustration, like a big aerial view of what it might have looked like. The main part of the Alamo that, that, that I showed you the photograph of earlier, that's over here. But it's this much larger sort of compound, right? Let me sit here for a minute. Now, the thing that's interested historians for years was that there were 6,000 Mexicans surrounding the Alamo and only 182 guys in sight. That's like 32 to 1 or 33 to 1 odds or something like that. 33 to 1. 33 to 1. If they'd all just charged to begin with and gone up the ladders and taken a bunch of, you know, losses or whatever, it would have been over so fast. But they couldn't get the Mexicans to charge. The, the, their officers, they couldn't get the foot soldiers to charge. They stayed back, like way back out here on the periphery, hidden behind walls and in trees and stuff fired cannonballs and you know the walls of the Alamo were made out of adobe which is mud basically so they're just blowing away the walls slowly but surely and they couldn't get them to charge and for over a hundred years like 150 years really Mexican and American historians really just couldn't understand it like how was it that they couldn't get them to charge and well a, a, a stash of documents official documents from the Mexican army from the Alamo were found about 15 years ago in a, a, somewhere in Mexico. Anyway, when they went through these documents, historians, they ended up finding these basically letters or official documents written by the generals under Santa Ana, and they discovered the reason as to why the Mexican troops would not charge the Alamo. The reason was because they thought that the Americans, the defenders in the Alamo, that they had sorcery or magic, like devilish magic on their side. Okay. Why would they think that? Well, all they knew was that whenever some guys tried to charge the walls, they'd see these really big long guns come up over the top. Okay, they, they, These Tennessee sharpshooters used particularly long bore rifles. And if you know anything about firearms, the longer the barrel, the more accuracy it has, right? So whenever they saw these really long guns come up over and come down like this, Julio next to you or, or, or Amigdio or Miguelito or whatever got his head blown off and you dive down and shit, man, these guys never missed. There was this bunch of guys with these really long guns they never missed. And the leader of those guys, because they could see up on the wall there, right, the leader of them, this guy had an animal riding on his head. Okay, now think about this, guys witches and warlocks and magicians and whatever, they have familiars, a black cat or a rat or a bat or a wolf, right? Or some kind of a creature that helps them in their magic and whatever. Well, the thing is, the Mexican troops couldn't see what kind of an animal it was. They don't have raccoons down in the southern part of Mexico. They didn't know what, what it was. All they could see was that this animal was hanging onto the top of the guy's head with its tail hanging down. So they thought that Davy Crockett was a brujo. 
B R U J O, a brujo, or a male witch, a warlock, and that he was giving he. He was making them like, they felt like these guys never missed with their shots and nobody wants to die, right? So they couldn't get them to charge until finally the walls were blown up enough and beaten down enough that, you know, finally it was like, okay, we can do this. And so they did charge. And that's when the guys at the Alamo got wiped out. Now, William Barrett Travis went down at the front gate over, over here, okay, fighting like a lion. He died like a man. And I give it to him. Jim Bowie had pneumonia and was basically in the sick bay, you know, somewhere in one of these buildings, like like coughing his lungs out. And three lancers charged in and basically stabbed him to death with bayonets. And he just pff, died, right? He was laying there in bed. Davy Crockett was captured under a great press of men with a bunch of other guys. A bunch of guys got captured. The next morning, they took all these guys. They lined him up against the wall. They put cigarettes in their mouths, gave them a smoke, and then brrr, firing squad executed them. And then they split. Okay, now, when I say that they split, here's what they did. Battle of the Alamo, March 6, 1836, right? After this, Santa Ana marches his army to Goliad. In Goliad, he executes 80, 80, 88, 80 or 80-something 80 just people Farmers, Americans, okay, uh, just for regular people, no guns, nothing. He just has these people executed, just like like an object lesson. That's not too cool, right? Then they headed off to the east because they knew that the most, the majority of the Americans were over in here. They headed in this direction, and they ultimately ended up about six weeks later at San Jacinto. Okay, now a couple of days after they left San Antonio, headed for Goliad. The bigger army, under the command of Sam Houston, arrived at San Antonio. What did they find? They found all the defenders of the Alamo rotting in the sun. Left, wherever they were killed, died, shot down, being uns eyes picked out by, by birds, ravens, crows, vultures, buzzards, wolves were in there, coyotes, maybe rats, javelinas, wild pigs. Horrible. And the sun, of course, swell up their bodies and they burst and they're all rotting. Horrible. Okay, now, this drove these Americans insane with anger, okay? Because the basic rules of warfare, going back hundreds of years, back into Europe, before anybody colonized the Americas, the basic rules of warfare were when Christians fight other Christians, a Christian army against a Christian army, this army wins, this army loses, they run away. What does this army do? They take care of the dead bodies. They bury them, if there's not too many of them. If there's way too many of them, they drag them together and they burn them. Okay? Now, did they always do this? You know, maybe not. Okay, but it was considered to be one of the rules of civilized warfare. Whatever that is. Okay, there were rules. And these no good Mexicans, they, they disrespected the defenders of the Alamo. They, they left, left them like animals to rot in the sun. So Sam Houston makes this speech, famous speech, after they've taken care of all of the dead. He got Davy Crockett's coonskin cap in his hand. I don't know, maybe. And he says to all of his guys, Remember what you've seen here today, boys, and remember this dirty work that we've been engaged in, taking care of this this sorry spectacle. Remember the Alamo. Remember what was done at the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. And so this, of course, becomes the great rallying cry, like up to this very day, for Texans. Remember the Alamo. It means, you know, kick ass and take names and don't back down, right? So Sam Houston and his guys get fired up. They follow the army. An army leaves a nice big trail. You always know where it's going. They get to Goliad. More dead people rotting in the sun. They get more angry. And then they follow the army to San Jacinto. Now, at San Jacinto, San, Santa Ana has camped out his army, and they're having a big barbecue. Hundreds and hundreds of cattle have been rounded up, slaughtered. They've got pitch dug, barbacoa, right? They're roasting meat, and they're, they're having like a big day of like rest and eating and drinking and whatever. Sam Houston's scouts, cavalry scouts, 
they come riding back 10 miles right to the army. And they say, look, they're, they're, they're bar barbecuing up. It's about noon at this point. They're going to be eating in about an hour. And they're eating red meat and drinking, you know, cerveza, pulque, whatever, all kinds of stuff. Right? So Sam Houston says, perfect. Then we're going to wait about two and a half, three hours, and we're going to hit them. Because you know damn good and well what they're going to do on a hot day like this after eating all that meat and drinking. And they're going to take one of them siestas, right? They're all going to be sleeping, and we're going to crush them. Remember the Alamo. And that's exactly what happens, guys. The Battle of San Jacinto is a complete disaster for Santa Ana. Okay? <clears throat> this is what happens to his army. Approximately. One-third of the army slaughtered. One-third of the army captured. One-third of the army flees, escapes in every damn direction, and ultimately tries to figure out which direction is south, and starts walking back home to whatever part of Mexico they're from. I mean, don't even, I don't even want to start thinking about how horrible that was. But okay. So the Americans win. It's a great victory. But then as they're rounding up all the guys that they've captured, POWs, and sticking them in a certain spot under guard. I mean, you're talking about maybe 1,500 guys, 16, 17, 1,800, I don't know. Anyway, they're, they're angry. They're saying, boy, we got a bunch of the officers here, but we don't have Santa Ana or Santa Ana. So they call them, where the hell is that Santa Ana? They don't know. Well, guess where Santa Ana is? Santa Ana was one of the greatest opportunists in the history of the world. He always found the best opportunity. <laughs> He's one of my favorite figures in history to lecture on. I can't talk about it much right now, but anyway, Santa Ana was basically uh, getting his ashes hauled, having some afternoon delight with the Senorita, right? You know, he, was, he was getting some action. He was having sex. He'd met this, uh, this woman, married, unmarried, somebody's daughter. I don't know, but he was, he was enjoying himself at a, at a home, at a villa on the outskirts of San Jacinto. But all of a sudden, in the distance, he hears a battle. Like, what in the hell? Oh, my God, we're being attacked, right? Now, you would imagine he would do this. Jump up, get into his uniform, get on his horse, and charge off to the battle. We don't really know why things went the way they went. But what happens is this. A bunch of American soldiers, let's say, Texans, these American, you know, guys, settlers... They find a guy near where all the POWs are, but kind of squatted down in a marshy area in the reeds, like kind of spying. And the guy's in his long underwear. You know what I mean? Long johns, like one-piece underwear with the flap on the back that you undo when you squat down to go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah he's in his underwear. The guy's got boots on and his long johns. <laughs> we have no idea. No one has ever been able to figure out why Santana wasn't in his uniform. Some have speculated that an angry husband caught him. And, uh, you know, he had to, like, go out the window. <laughs> I don't know. The bottom line is, they catch him. They say, well, look at this guy here. He was going to the bathroom in the reeds, and he missed the whole battle. They don't know who he is. They don't know what Santana looks like. They <coughs> don't have a clue in the world. They just have his uniform on, right? So they come marching him back to where all the POWs are. Hey, we caught another one. And when all these POWs, these Mexican soldiers, when they see their general, their president, the dictator of Mexico marching in. What do they do? They all jump up and they salute, which of course tips these guys like, oh, who do we have here, Santa? You know, and you can imagine Santa Ana like, Calla Taylor! <laughs> right? He screwed my game, right? La cagaste, man. What are you doing? Oh, dang. Okay. So now they say, well, we're going to hang Santa Ana. We're going to hang him. It's the greatest thing ever, right? Okay. And they had this big plan to hang Santa Ana, I forgot about this. Here's the Battle of San Jacinto. You can pause, you can look at it. It's another one by Henry McArdle. I don't like the guy's art, like I said, but there it is for historical purposes, okay? Sam Houston, years later, when he's a senator in the United States Congress, and again, Santa Ana, but okay. The Surrender of Santa Ana by William Henry Huddle, painted 60 years later, roughly. Here we have Santa Ana. Okay, here you have Sam Houston. Here's Def Smith, the famous uh, Texan scout with one hand up to his ear because he was, that's how they called him, Def Smith, because he couldn't hear very well. Right? He's like, what? What's going on? Here are the Mexican flags that have been captured. Okay, well, this looks great. 
But this isn't the way it went. Okay, it didn't happen like this. What happened was they went to hang Santa Ana, literally, up on a horse with a noose around his neck. And then as quick as he could, he said, look, I'll sign off. I'll give you Texas. You can have your independence. Like, you just talk it as fast as he can, right, because he didn't want to be hung. And they say, yeah, you know, okay, this is actually a better thing. Yeah, right, yeah. Maybe we, you know, maybe we can't get away with hanging the president or dictator of another country. Like, maybe that's like a little too much. It's not like the guy's a horse thief. But ultimately, they say, okay, right. And what happens is they draft a document granting Texas her independence. At that point, the independent republic of Texas comes into being. Let me go back a minute. I should have a map right here, but I don't. Okay, but here it is. This is a brand new country, okay, that comes into being as a result of the deal that is made with Santa Ana. He's the president of Mexico, the dictator of Mexico. He can sign off on this. He signs his name. I'm giving this piece of real estate its independence. It becomes the Republic of Texas. It is not part of the United States yet, not for 10 years, okay? In 1845, it's annexed, okay? into the United States, it becomes a state. <clears throat> but for one decade, it's its own independent country under the presidency of Sam Houston. Right now, later, this and up here, even further than I can go and over and down, and then all this pink, right? Not that up there, but this. That's going to be the state of Texas, but that's later. Okay, for the time being, we have a brand new independent country here between the United States and Mexico, under the presidency of Sam Houston. It is going to be part of the United States soon, but not quite yet. Now, what I want you guys to do for a minute, or a few minutes, a while, is chill out here, okay, on this concept of this independent Texas, okay, and we're going to put that on the back burner, and we're going to focus ourselves on the greatest state in the Union, <clears throat> that's where our attention needs to go for 20 or 30 minutes or so, the greatest state in the Union, great, grand, groovy, golden, you know what I'm going to say, California, beyond any shadow of a doubt, the greatest state in the Union. You all know that, or if you're from some other state and you don't know that, well, I'm teaching you something here right now, you know. Okay, I'm sorry if you're from some other state. There's nothing I can do about it. California is the greatest state in the Union. You may say, why? Well, say, prove it to me. Well, here's a map of the United States. The United States of awesome. What does your state do really well? It's pretty good. California is the safest state for workers. We have more laws on the books to protect the rights and the health and the well-being of working people than any other state. Very progressive. Very liberal, very cool, very groovy, in fact. Here's a map that shows the company that maybe best symbolizes the state where it came from originally. You know, Ohio, Wendy's, hamburgers, hey, you know, Hooters, yeah, yeah, Dr. Pepper, Super 8, Taco John's. I mean, California, come on, guys, Apple. Hello, I mean, find me a state <coughs> that can claim something as good as Apple. Look for a while, you ain't going to find it. What else? The fast food franchise most associated with a given state, okay? In and out Burger, guys, starting in California. In and out do, 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 do. you know the song? In and out that's what a hamburger's all about, right? Yeah, in and out I mean, forget about it. And that's the greatest, right? It's California, baby. Okay, and what else? Guys, what about music? In the decade of the 60s alone, the Beach Boys, Love, Doors, Creedence, Jeff Zerpling, The Dead, The Birds, etc. In the 70s, you got Fleetwood Mac, The Eagles, Jackson Brown, Johnny Mitchell, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Lynn, Ron Said, Tom Waits, the California sound that the whole world was trying to mimic. Everybody wanted to go to California to be in California because of the sound of this music. In the 80s, the greatest punk rock, this side of the clash, certainly the greatest American punk rock, all from California. The Circle Jerks, Black Flag, Fear, 
the Minutemen, the Go-Go's, started as a punk rock band. The Dead Kennedys, Social D, the Germs, and the Mighty X. The greatest punk album of all time, Los Angeles. California, guys, okay? Rap, right? The hip-hop movement, N.W.A., Ice-T, Cypress Hill, Tupac. I mean, this is, I mean, for just California, it's L.A. We're talking about one city in California. Heavy metal. I hate most of it, but Van Halen, the greatest. Rage Against the Machine, Motley Crue, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, guys. California bands, okay? And the alternative scene in the 80s and 90s. The Chili Peppers, Concrete Blonde, Jane's Addiction, Weezer, Offspring, No Doubt, Los Lobos, The Blasters, etc. California, okay? Born and bred. What about writers from California? Some of the greatest writers in American history. In science fiction, Dune, Richard Matheson, Edgar Rice Burroughs, the, the Jack Vance, for God's sakes, Ray Bradbury, recent literature, Pulitzer Prize winners, Michael Chabon, great crime fiction, legendary crime fiction, Raymond Chandler, Walter Mosley, James Elroy, the beat writers like Lawrence Ferlinghetti, I think he's stuck under my picture in the corner, you might not see that, but Jack London, Ambrose Bierce, Charles Bukowski, John Steinbeck. California, I mean, raise the roof, right? Come on. And Hollywood, California, almost all the greatest movies ever made came from California, came from L.A., in fact. And that's not everything. Well, it kind of is, because there are some things, I mean, look, I'm a Californian, but i got to be fair. We do lead the nation on air pollution, isn't that the greatest thing in the world? Uh, and even though in and out is unquestionably great, we also started Wiener Schnitzel, Carl's Jr., Taco Bell, McDonald's. You know, it's a lot of fast food that we've given the world, and it may be tasty, or it may not be, depending on your perspective. But, you know, not the greatest part of the California legacy, but I think you're getting the idea. The bottom line is that California has done a lot of awesome, okay? basically. Now, if we're going to consider California, we need to consider the name California. Where did it come from? California was named by Spanish explorers, and the name was derived from the name Calafia. You see her right here. This is a great tile mosaic, a mural from San Francisco showing Princess Calafia. Calafia was the queen of <clears throat> of an of an island of women warriors, okay, who didn't have any use for men. They were based on the Amazons from the ancient Greek myths. If you guys have ever read Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, you've got the Amazons mentioned in there. Maybe you guys saw that wretched ugh, Superman versus Batman movie. Somebody might be watching this video lecture in 10 years, but the movie just came out this summer. I mean, holy, pardon my hiccup. Holy cow, that was bad. But here you've got uh, Gail Godot, right, and her Wonder Woman getup. Good looking girl. Here's the, the for real deal in Wonder Woman in the comics. Great illustration by John Byrne. Okay, Amazonian princess, right? If you ever saw the movie Troy, not a good movie. How do you make a movie about the Trojan War without Greek gods in it? Terrible. It's got some good moments. Brad Pitt plays Achilles, the mightiest of the Greek warriors. Achilles had a best friend named Patroclus, who was not just his best pal and also a tough warrior, but also his lover. The great Greek warriors of the Trojan War were bisexual. They all had wives at home, kids, and they also had male lovers in the army, so that when they were out on campaign, they'd have somebody to, you know, relax with, let's say. Okay, Achilles loved Patroclus more than anything. Maybe even his wife and kids, but his head was turned, what? Okay, by an Amazonian princess named Penthe... Pen what was her name? Penthe... Penthelisea. Penthelisea, yeah. Because the Amazons were gorgeous. They were unbelievable warriors. They were so tough that when they got old enough to have breasts... You had to cut your own right breast off and sew up the wound so that it would never get in the way of you pulling the bowstring back. 
okay? So you could be the maximum warrior. I mean, talk about macho or macha, right? Okay, so Amazonian, you know, sex goddess, Achilles seducing, war making, I mean, unbelievable women here, right? That is where California got her name. California, Calafia, Pentelicea, California. When the Spanish explorers saw California, they said, majestic, mysterious, exotic, beautiful, forbidding, like an Amazon, like, oh, Cali yeah, <clears throat> California, okay? But here's my question to you. What did Americans on the other end of the country, on the East Coast, back around 1800, 1800, let's say, okay, just when Jefferson becomes president, what did they know about the other side of the continent, 3,000 miles away, this place called California? Or did they know anything about it? Anything at all? Well, they did, actually. They knew a fair amount about it. Because there were sailors that made trips out to California and came back and they told stories about the place. Most famous of these sailors would be a guy named Richard Henry Dana. If you live in Southern California, you probably have heard of Dana Point, named after the dude. Okay, He was the son of a fairly wealthy man and he wanted to see the world before he settled down into the business thing with his dad. And so he went out and he became a merchant marine, a seaman. He just worked on a ship, like just like a regular dude, not like a guy that had a bunch of money. He just went and he became a sailor. And when he came back from his travels, he published a book called Two Years Before the Mast. Okay? Now, it was made into a terrible movie in the 1950s, starring Alan Ladd. Yeah, but, you know, whatever. That doesn't dilute the importance of the book. Richard Henry Dana left Boston, Massachusetts on this ship, and they sailed across the Atlantic, around Africa, off through India, and through the Orient and all there, across the Pacific to California, and then down around South America, back to Boston. It took two years to go around the world. In those two years, Dana visited places with names like Zanzibar, Sri Lanka, Arabia, Madagascar, Australia, Shanghai, California, exotic, mysterious places. The last place that he wrote about in the book was California. What did he have to say about California? He said, California is the Garden of Eden. Now think about this. You're reading the book, right? Okay. Garden of Eden. You stop. All Americans at this time very religious, right? So you stop and you think about church, the Bible, right? You know, you, th you think the Garden of Eden. You mean the place that Adam and Eve got kicked out of? The perfect paradise that God threw them out of? That's what California's like? I got to read about this, right? Yeah, he said it's the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> he said the soil there is so fertile that it produces fruits and vegetables far bigger and with brighter and richer colors and flavors than anything that you've ever even dreamt of in your wildest imaginings. And you're going, wow, what? really? Right? You're reading about it, right? He says the climate. I mean, you guys, look at this. Look at these fruit crate images, right? The climate in California, Southern California. Legendary, right? He says the climate is, is perfect. Even in the winter, it's like you can take your shirt off and wear short pants like a little kid and kick around in the ocean. And think about this. Richard Henry Dana is from Boston, where a nice warm day is like 60 degrees or something. Boston is cold. Boston is cold rain and snow, and right? It's up in the northern part of the world on the planet. Hey, nothing like SoCal, baby. Nothing like SoCal. So Dana they visited there in December. It was probably 65 degrees. For Dana... Christmas time is like 20 degrees or something. All the sailors are like, wow, what a place this is, right? They love it. They say, Look at the weather and the soil and the fruit, the vegetable, the sunshine, right? Okay, and then he says, And the people are the most hospitable, the nicest, 
the most pleasant, wonderful people you have ever met anywhere. I went around the world. They're the greatest people I ever met. These Californios, these Spanish dons and their wives and their families. Now, <clears throat> what he mostly wrote about was Santa Barbara, which is why I have these famous old Santa Barbara, like, tourist posters here, okay? Look at this, the old Spanish days. This is something they do every year in Santa Barbara. They have this festival where they sort of, they reenact and they try to like reimagine what it was like in the days of the Spanish ranchos, right? Look at this, this is great stuff, okay? Dana says, the men, the men are, are tall with erect carriage and broad shoulders. They have noble brows and aquiline features. They look like the noble Greeks and Romans from the old stories. And the women, they all have those hourglass figures mm -hmm, that really gets a man to thinking of <laughs> bedroom thoughts, right? And these bedroom eyes, their eyes are heavily lidded, you know, like, like the L Latina eyes, right? The nice exotic, alluring eyes, right? He says, and they make you think, uh, boy, oh boy, but they're, but they're, they're good Christian Catholic women. They're, they're, they, I mean, they make you think about things, but, you know, they're off limits. Or, but so hospitable, these people. He says, they just, they eat, they drink, and they have parties, and they dance. He said, they have a party like three times a week. He says, they have so many parties, they had to come with more words for it. I mean, what do we have back in the United States? We have one word, we have party. They have Fandango and Fiesta and Barbacoa, and I, some of them I forgot about. Like, they just, it's, oh my God. So think about this again. Think about who you are. Who are you reading this, perchance? A lot of Americans. You're like this woman, sitting by the fire, reading the book, and outside, it looks like this. California. It's like, it's just on the other side of the continent. All I'd have to do, if I, if I just turned my face to the west and walked long enough, it's right over here, right? It, the only thing between me and it is distance, air, eh, a lot of mountain ranges and Indians. <laughs> it wouldn't be easy, right? But just think about it. People back east, they're thinking about it. Believe me, they're thinking about it. They're reading this going, boy, this California sounds... Huh. It's, whenever they hear the word California, you know, because it's not just the book. It's sailors that come back and they tell stories. Think about this, guys. At this time in history, early 1800s, almost every American alive, they never in their entire life go more than like 10 miles away from their house because it takes a long time to travel places. They don't have cars, right? And not very many people even have enough money to take enough time off from work to go anywhere. They have to work every day, all the day, right, just to stay alive. Okay. So think about how amazing and interesting this... It, it's like Oz, El Dorado, <coughs> Shangri-La. It's like another world. And when somebody says the name California to you, some sailor t telling a story, or somebody just mentions, well, you know, I heard out in California, or whatever... It's like you feel a warm breeze across the back of your neck. You smell spices in the air, and you, <laughs> California. I mean, people are enchanted, intoxicated, ensorcelled by the idea of this California way out there, named after a sexy Amazonian warrior queen princess or something. And where do you live? What's the place that you live in called? Maryland? Maryland. 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 What's Maryland? What's Maryland named after? Uh, a queen named Mary from England. What about Virginia, the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth? What about Carolina? Oh, Caroline. And Georgia, King George, right? New York, the Duke of York. New Jersey. You guys getting the idea? Now, there are some places back east that have groovy Indian names. Massachusetts, Connecticut, okay. But most of them are named after boring, old, dead English people from the other side of the world that had bad teeth and wore stupid wigs and smelled or horrible. California, on the other hand, is groovy, dreamy exotic, mysterious. 
And so people begin to fall in love with California. And as more and more Americans learn more and more about California, that love of California and the West, remember Lewis and Clark and the beginning of our love of the West, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, But how is it that we begin to learn more and more and more and more about California? Well, I'll tell you in the next part of the lecture.